um, uh, some of the, the slides before, as well as any um, general questions about the Canadian market, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or, or us here. Um, my contact information is included in, at the very end of this uh, presentation. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Krista Coventry, who's the Director of Regulatory Services at Source Nutraceutical. And Source Nutraceutical provides various market entry services for foods, natural health products, as well as um, other types of products. Uh, and the services include regulatory compliance, graphic design, and packaging compliance. So I'll uh, turn it over to Krista to speak more about this. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Heidi, for the introduction, and thanks everyone for tuning in today. Um, hopefully everyone can hear okay through the mic. Uh, the presentation media will be made available uh, to all attendees after, so don't worry about trying to scroll down the information. It will be sent through uh, for you, and any questions can be handled uh, at the end of the talk. with us here. Our computer has decided to take a little nap. Sorry about that. We are frozen. So while we're starting this out, I'll just give a, a bit of an outline about what we thought we would present today. Um, we'd start with a little bit of an overview about the Canadian market and then speak briefly about the Canadian regulatory framework for foods here in Canada. I'll spend about 10 minutes talking to you about the food labeling regulations specifically, and then probably another 10 minutes or so talking about regulatory modernization. Um, so we're in a period of intense regulatory modernization here, much like you are in the U.S. as well. We'll spend about 15 minutes talking about label claims and health claims, which I know a lot of you will be interested in. And then um, our guys thought it would be beneficial just to provide an overview on uh, food safety as we're in a period of food safety updates and modernization as well. So we'll start uh, just talking a little bit about Canada. So. We have three major centers here in Canada. Uh, we're located today here in Toronto. Uh, we joke that that's the center of the universe. Also Vancouver, the major port on the west coast, and then Montreal, a major port on the east coast. Our total population is approximately 36 million people, but 82.1% of that population is actually located in those three urban centers. Interestingly enough, Toronto is now North America's third largest retail market, having surpassed Chicago. Um, so really, if you're looking at the Canadian market, those three major centers or ports uh, should be of interest on your radar for distribution. Our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, uh, we've heard that he's quite dreamy, um, and the median age of our consumer is 40.8 years old, so just from a demographic perspective. Um, I've worked myself in the industry for 20 years now, and, and I honestly say that our retail uh, food market is rapidly expanding. So uh, 20 years ago, you would go to the grocery store and buy groceries, and now um, you can obtain foods or value-add foods at a wide variety of retail locations. So that can include basic grocery stores, but also specialty stores, health food stores, pharmacies. We're still seeing outlets from farmers markets, but then now also new outlets, such as convenience stores or gas stations. Um, so really, when considering uh, broad distribution for the Canadian market, we're not just looking at historical uh, bricks and mortar retail. I've done a summary for you of the five major categories that one would consider in the space. Obviously, today we're going to focus on food regulatory law, um, but we do have natural health products, non-prescription drugs or OTCs. We have cosmetics and we have supplemented foods. We can also call those fortified foods. Today we're going to stick with what I would call traditional foods, and those are governed by the Food and Drugs Act and regulations of 1985. Um, those regulations are obviously quite dated. They're over 30 years old, and as I mentioned, they're in the process of being updated through several different regulatory modernization initiatives, and we'll talk a little bit about those today. So moving on, we'll spend a bit of time talking about actual regulations that would impact um, yourself as you start to consider the Canadian market. So we have several key players who regulate the Canadian food industry, Government of Canada being one, and we just celebrated our 150th birthday here. We have Health Canada, we have CFIA, which is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and we have CBSA, which is the Canadian Border Services Agency. Health Canada deals with safety-related aspects of packaging compliance, such as nutritional composition, safety, and claims. 
while the CFIA deals with non-safety-related aspects of packaging compliance, such as best before dating, country of origin claims, etc. We'll learn more about these aspects of Canadian packaging compliance as we delve into our snapshot about the Canadian regulations. So we mentioned a minute ago the Food and Drugs Act of Regulations of 1985, but there are other legislations, although quite dated, that relate to claims for health or packaging or advertising of foods in Canada. So if you're considering the Canadian market, we have three sets of regulations to consider. The Consumer Packaging and Labeling Act of 1971, as I mentioned a moment ago, the FDR of 1985, and as well, we have a more modern set of regulations, the Safe Food for Canadians Act and Regulations of 2012, which were actually just brought into force last year, 2019. And we'll spend a little bit of time later in the presentation talking about the Safe Food for Canadians Act and Regulations and how that might impact companies such as yourselves considering export to the Canadian market. So when we look at the regulatory definition of foods per the Canadian Food and Drug Regulations, a food can be defined as any article that's manufactured, sold, or represented as a source of nutrients or energy. And that difference from a fortified food or a supplemented food in which you have added ingredients to that food to bring an added health benefit. So for the purpose of the dialogue today, we're talking about traditional foods which are consumed as a source of nutrients or energy. We have the Food and Drug Regulations, and there are separate divisions of the FDR pertaining to different Canadian food commodities, including different sections for alcoholic beverages, coffee and tea, food colors, flavorings, spices and seasonings, dairy, fruits and vegetables, grains, meat and poultry, as well as salts and sweetening agents. There are also separate sections of the FDR relating to food additives, food packaging materials, irradiation of certain foods, novel foods, and foods for special dietary use, meal replacements, meal replacements or nutritional supplements. And we'll talk a bit more about those specific categories in a short while. In Canada, we have both federally registered and non-federally registered sectors of, of, of commodities. The nationally regulated sectors are including meat and poultry, dairy and dairy products, eggs, honey, fish and seafood, fresh fruits and vegetables. And these commodities are all federally regulated by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, or the CFIA. We also have a non-federally registered sector, which encompasses a wide range of products, including bakery products, cereal products, infant foods, as well as alcoholic beverages. These foods can be marketed intra-provincially, intra-territorially, uh, intra or also imported. The jurisdiction for the inspection of non-federally registered foods is shared between both CFIA federal body, as well as provincial or territorial governments, because the sector also includes a large variety of foods that are marketed solely between provinces. With respect to requirements for ac market access for traditional foods, the Food and Drug Regulations stipulate that no person shall sell an article of food that is unfit for human consumption. So it must be manufactured, prepared, preserved, packaged, or stored in sanitary conditions, so not under unsanitary conditions. It cannot contain in part or in whole of any putrid or rotten materials. It cannot contain any poisons, and importantly, it cannot be adulterated. When we consider traditional foods, most traditional foods are able to access the Canadian market without any sort of pre-market review or approval by Health Canada. However, there are certain types of foods or food ingredients that do require pre-market review and approval by Health Canada, and I've listed those categories here for you today. We have novel foods, which are foods that are being given to consumers for the first time and therefore have to undergo a safety review. So examples of novel foods would be sweeteners that haven't been given in Canada before, genetically modified foods or genetically modified processes, or seeds, for example, that have been genetically modified to produce crops. Separately, food additives, I mentioned a minute ago, sweeteners are a good example of that. Infant formulas obviously require pre-market review because of the increased risk. Um, foods for special dietary use, meal replacements and nutritional supplements, and also supplemented or fortified foods. So again, for the purpose of our conversation today, we're going to leave supplemented and fortified foods aside. Um, if there's interest in that, certainly companies can follow up uh, either with Argyle or with Source. But we're going to focus just on our traditional food format for the purpose of our dialogue today. 
I wanted to spend just a moment talking about compliance and enforcement. So again, that falls at the federal level to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Their mandate is to enforce policies and regulations relating to the importation of foods and agricultural products to Canada. The CFIA has many key roles, including compliance verification via inspection and surveillance activities, investigation of reported problems such as trade complaints that may come in from competitors or adverse events, compliance and enforcement action, and that can include AMPs, which are our administrative monetary penalties, as well as response to industry requests. So that's the example of export certificates or import permits. The government has more power to enforce uh, AMPs, administrative monetary penalties, under the Safe Food for Canadian regulations than it did 10 years ago, for example. And that really is an assurance. Um, certainly in Canada, we're not as litigious as, as most uh, American consumers might be, but there still is that understanding that under the CFIA umbrella, um, there can be penalties for companies who don't comply with the regulations um, at a serious level. So we'll move away from general framework now and really delve into the actual regulations that relate to labeling and packaging compliance for Canadian foods. So we'll start with nutrition labeling. And I mentioned before, but per the food and drug regulations, all Canadian foods must carry a label when offered for sale. And that applies to all prepackaged products. However, you'll find in regulatory affairs, for every exception, there is a rule. So we do have exceptions to those prepackaged products including prepackaged confections, such as one-bite confections that are individually sold, or prepackaged products containing fresh fruits or vegetables that are packaged in a wrapper of less than a half an inch in width. Really, when you consider packaging for the Canadian market, it's best to think that broadly, if you have extra small packaging, there are different regulations that can be applied because the government understands that we can't necessarily fit all of that information onto a small package. But I've given an example here today of a label that does have mandatory labeling requirements. And these are the requirements that must be on all foods to be compliant in the Canadian market. So first of all, we have a common name or fanciful name, and it's also commonly known as its statement of identity. So in this example, a fruit spread. That identifies what type of a food product we're dealing with. We have the net quantity. You'll notice that that's in metric units, not in imperial for the Canadian market. That's one of our main differences here. We have the nutrition facts table. In the US, you call it a nutrition facts panel. Again, when coming to the Canadian market, we need to look at a Canadian version of that, and we'll talk a little bit about how that differs in a moment. We have the ingredient listing, and then as well, a Canadian dealer name and address. And then finally, date marking. There are exemptions to the mandatory labeling requirements. So for common names, certain fruits and vegetables that are packaged in a way where a common name wouldn't be possible. For net quantity, there are exemptions for individual portions served with meals or snacks, such as ketchup. For nutrition facts, there are exemptions for fresh food, because obviously we can't stick a nutrition facts table on an orange or an apple. Um, for listing ingredients, certain individual sauces, ketchup again, or standardized vinegar. And then again, exemptions for fresh fruits and vegetables packaged at the retail level don't have to have dealer name and addresses. So again, in a general sense, we think of these six key components for labels, but understanding that in certain circumstances, uh, there are or can be a few exemptions. So we'll look first at the net quantity declaration, which always, for prepackaged products, appears on the principal display panel, or PDP, that's the front panel of your Canadian food label. And again, as I mentioned, it must be appeared uh, or labeled in metric units. So just an example here, if we're dealing with a product by volume or liquid, we're dealing with milliliters, or if greater than 1,000 milliliters, in liters. By weight for solid, we're looking in grams. Again, if over 1,000 grams, we're dealing with kilograms. Or by count, if we're looking at certain foods like candied apples or um, other products that would be uh, best served by count as opposed to by volume or weight. We'll take a minute next to talk about ingredient listings, um, one of the key uh, reasons to really engage in regulatory review of your product prior to coming to Canada. So this is an example of our old format of ingredient listing, and we'll talk in a few minutes about the differences between the new and the old formats. But you'll see here in this listing, we have ingredients declared by their common name in descending order of their proportion by weight. That declaration must be in the order or percentage of the ingredients before they are combined to form that prepackaged product. Again, 
wherever there's a rule, there's an exemption. So there are exemptions to the order declaration rule, and that applies to certain commodities such as spices, seasonings or herbs, natural or artificial flavors, flavor enhancers, food additives, or vitamins, minerals, and their salts. So we'll take a minute now and talk about the Nutrition Facts Tables, or NFTs, and this is an example of the old format of Nutrition Facts Tables. It's still currently valid for the Canadian market. Um, so we'll take a look at the key components. We have serving size declared, the number of calories in the food, the percent DV, which is the percent daily value uh, obtained by consuming that food, and then nutritional information on 13 core nutrients. So that's our fat, our saturated fat and trans fat, cholesterol, sodium, carbohydrates, and fiber. We have sugars, protein, and then four ingredients at the bottom, vitamin A, C, calcium, and iron. There are additional mandatory labeling requirements for nutrition labels in Canada, and I've grouped them into three categories. We have commodity-specific requirements, the requirement for bilingual labeling, and then requirements for allergen labeling. I will spend a few minutes speaking to you about allergen labeling because it is becoming more of a growing industry concern. Not only in North America, but worldwide, allergens are a growing concern. That is largely due to the risk of, re of foods which are recalled to, due to allergen contamination. And this has manufacturers considering how their products are packaged, labeled, and processed. <clears throat> I did a little research, and according to the USDA, the number of related food recalls due to allergens has increased drastically, from 13% in 2008 up to 35% in 2012, and that's based on recent USDA data. This trend has definitely exposed vulnerabilities in some allergen control plans and also highlights a need for better allergen control managers. When considering allergen control plans, we can consider three key steps to both creating and implementing effective allergen control plans, focusing on risk assessment, running through hazard analyses to help identify potential food allergen sources, and mapping out the pathways in your manufacturing process where allergens may become a risk, management of those risks, developing instructions, processes, and standard operating, operating procedures, or SOPs, to help control the possibility of unintentional allergens being contaminated in your food product, and also communication of those risks, making sure that your food labels are clear and accurate, developing a communication plan to help everyone in your supply chain informed of potential allergen risks in your foods. I wanted to highlight that in Canada, uh, we have a slight variation in a listing of priority allergens compared to the U.S. So while the U.S. has the big eight allergens, we have peanuts, tree nuts, shellfish, and fish, dairy milk, wheat, soy, and eggs, we have an additional three priority allergens here in Canada, including sesame, mustard, and sulfites, bringing the total number of priority allergens in the Canadian market to 11. Because um, priority allergens are becoming more of a focus, we do have several uh, ways to present allergen declarations on Canadian labels. So the first situation we'll consider is prepackaged foods which contain priority food allergens, gluten sources, or added sulfites. In that instance, allergens must be declared at least once in the listing of ingredients. So you can see here uh, in this sample label, we have wheat, eggs, and whole milk. So again, when allergens are present in the food, this declaration is mandatory. You can also see some use of precautionary statements, such as may contain statements. These statements are considered to be voluntary and are used only if there is a risk of unavoidable or inadvertent presence of priority allergens. So for example, that can be through accidental cross-contamination in manufacturing, despite the use of GMPs. So in this instance, we would see a statement at the bottom of the food label, may contain. So in this instance, we can see that this product definitely contains wheat, eggs, and whole milk, but it also may contain or may can have come in contact with uh, pecans, which are a priority uh, tree nut allergen. In the third situation, we have contained statements. Um, so this is in the instance where food allergens, gluten sources, and adult sites can be listed separately in a contained statement and that would happen immediately after the primary ingredient listing. So in this example, we have all priority allergens listed 
in a contained statement. So this product definitely contains wheat, eggs, and milk, but it also may contain or may have come in contact with peanuts. So this is just ensuring that you're saying loud and clear to anyone with a potential allergy that those allergens are declared in your food product. The next component to consider is bilingual labeling. So here in Canada, we are a bilingual community uh, country, and we have two national languages, which are English and French. So for Canadian food labels, uh, all mandatory labeling requirements must appear in both official languages. In Quebec, which is our province, which is primarily French speaking in its entirety, both mandatory and voluntary label components must be bilingual. So there's an extra consideration um, for your food label real estate if you're looking at marketing or distributing your products into Quebec. But of course, like everything else we've talked about today, exemptions do exist. Full exemptions are possible for shipping containers, specialty foods, local foods, or test market foods. Finally, when we consider commodity-specific requirements, there are additional considerations for labeling for fat and moisture declarations for cheeses. When considering meat and meat byproducts, including poultry that are barbecued, roasted or broiled, and packaged at retail. When considering grades of beef, and when considering phosphated meats and meat products packaged at the retail level. So taking a break now, we'll take a look at modernization. So I mentioned at the start of our talk today um, that in Canada, we're in a, a period of intense regulatory modernization. And so I wanted to provide a bit of an overview to you, understanding that in the U.S. you're undergoing food regulatory modernization as well. So you will recall that we discussed at the, at the beginning of our talk both Health Canada and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And both those government agencies that govern food, relation, uh, food regulations, including imported foods, um, are currently in the process of broad modernization across all food product categories. We also discussed earlier how Health Canada deals with safety-related aspects of food labeling, while CFIA deals primarily with non-safety-related aspects of food labeling. Both arms of the Canadian government have undertaken regulatory modernization initiatives in the past few years relating specifically to food labeling, so I wanted to take a few minutes to understand and communicate recent updates to our food regulatory system. So we'll start first with Health Canada. And Health Canada started thinking about regulatory modernization uh, 12 years ago, or 13 years ago now, I guess back in 2007, when they first introduced their standardized nutrition labels. That was the nutrition facts tables, ingredients list, and optional nutrition claims. In 2013, Health Canada undertook broad regulatory modernization initiatives and then turned to Canadians to consult in 2014 on how they could best modernize their food labeling system. Between July and September of 2014, Health Canada intensively consulted with industry, and in June of 2015, the first pass of the nutrition labeling regulations were published in Canada Gazette 1. That's our regulatory approval process for new regulations. In December of 2016, the regulations were published in Gazette 2, and a five-year implementation deadline was given by which you could update your Health Canada labeling changes, putting the deadline at December of 2021. There has been talk recently about Health Canada pushing that uh, deadline back by one year to December of 2022 to allow companies more time to modernize and move to the new labeling system. What that means for companies wanting to bring foods into Canada is that you currently have an option. So if you were to walk into a Canadian retail store, grocery, um, and look at Canadian food labels today, February of 2020, you would see some foods that had the old nutrition labeling system and some foods that have the new nutrition labeling system. So while that might be a bit confusing for, for consumers in Canada, um, don't be alarmed, there are subtle differences, but basically it allows companies such as yourselves that are con considering the Canadian market to access one format or the other. At Source, we feel it's strategic to consider which system might be best for your food products. And I'll give an example. Um, and we'll talk about it in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we do talk about um, changes to sugar labeling. So for example, if your product contained several sources of sugar, combining those sources of sugar would mean that the first ingredient declared in your product would need to be sugar under the new labeling system. So knowing that that's coming um, and that you'd be required to declare that by the end of 2021, it may be strategic to consider uh, reaching out to a consultant or to your own internal R&D 
and looking at potentially um, making modifications to those formulations to perhaps lower the sugar content with the understanding that you could use the old labeling system for the short term while you undertook that initiative. And that's really just strategic planning long term, which is why the government gave that nice five-year window to update labels. I wanted to provide a summary for you, and this slide really does that, that talks about an overview of the key changes under Health Canada's food labeling modernization. One of the big differences is revised serving sizes. And while that might seem like a misnomer, it really is important. The rationale behind that was not all serving sizes had been standard across food commodities in recent years. And they did that to help consumers um, educate themselves better and make informed food choices at the retail level. So for example, um, bread is a good example. Um, if I was going to the grocery store and considering two loaves of bread side by side, and I picked up one loaf of bread, it might have a serving size declaration per one slice of bread whereas a different loaf of bread might have a serving size declaration per two, or per slice, I'm sorry, per one slice of bread uh, versus per two slices of bread. So obviously most consumers would, would consume a sandwich, which would be two slices of bread. Um, so the consumer would look quickly at those two nutrition facts tables and see that there might be way more calories in the product that had two, uh, slice, uh, two serving slice uh, NFT. And that might lead them away from purchasing that food product because they thought it had twice the number of calories, not really understanding that the serving size was different. So one of the initiatives, as I mentioned, in this uh, Health Canada modernization is to insert for certain food categories that the standard size is consistent. So all food products you know, declare for um, bread that it's per two, um, per two slices. The next line item is an, an emphasis on percent daily value. So again, considering the health status of Canadians, we're under a healthy uh, living and healthy eating initiative here in Canada. So wanting to look at ingredients of health concerns, so your fats, your sugars, and your sodium, emphasizing percent daily value. So there's now going to be a statement at the bottom of Canadian uh, NFTs that said 5% or less of a percent daily value is a little, and greater than 15% of a daily value is a lot. And again, that just helps to inform consumers about how much of those ingredients of health concern are in their food labels and just might make more informed food choices. We do have a new percent daily value for sugar, again, focusing on sugar as an ingredient of health concern um, with concern for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. Health Canada removed the percent DV for both fiber and CHO, which is carbohydrate. And they did that because those ingredients are not ingredients of health concern. Uh, fiber is of a health benefit. Um, and so they really wanted consumers to focus on um, those ingredients of health concern, not health benefit. You'll see formatting changes to the list of ingredients, grouping of common ingredients like sugar, and we will talk about that in a future slide. You'll see potassium as a new mandatory ingredient um, in the NFT. And again, that has to do with the role of potassium in blood pressure, heart disease, um, and concern for Canadian consumers. You'll see changes to food colorant labeling, and that's to better align with codex and international uh, standards, which actually makes it easier um, to access Canadian colorant labeling, as well as a new health claim for fruits and vegetables on certain food products. So lots of change happening in the new system. We'll take a look at the nutrition facts tables. So on the left, I have a current or original nutrition facts table that could be in the market until December of 2021. And then on the right, I have the new format proposed. Um, so again, you can see either of these, but we'll be moving towards that new format. So we've highlighted a few key differences. Um, the serving size stands out more and is more similar on similar foods, and we talked about that a moment ago. You'll also see that the font uh, declaration for calories is larger, and there's a bar underneath, so you can more readily available or more readily identify um, how, many calor how many calories are available in food products. The percent daily values have been updated. We also have a new percent daily value for total sugars. Um, and at the bottom, <coughs> excuse me, the excuse me, the milligram amounts have changed for the ingredients. So we have now potassium calcium and iron, but we've removed vitamins A and vitamin C. The reason for that, <clears throat> pardon me, is that now in, in Canada we don't have that risk of vitamin A deficiency or vitamin C deficiency like we would have back in 1985 um, when the Canadian food regulations were published. So again, just updating that list of minerals to include ingredients of public health concern. I did want to call out, and I can't recall if I have it, I do, I have it on the next slide, um, the differences between the new Canadian um, modernization format and the U.S. format. So I mentioned, of course, sugars with that new percent daily value. 
And you'll see the difference between your U.S. labeling system where you have total sugars and added sugars. When we underwent our Canadian modernization um, process, one of the things that Health Canada consulted industry on was that total sugar versus added sugar. And um, they ended up deciding to move, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, to move away from total, um, from added sugars and just focus on the total amount of sugar in a product. So that's one key difference to keep in mind when you approach the Canadian market is that you will not be required to call out the added sugars in your product. It will just be grouped according to a total amount of sugar. The next key difference is um, so number of servings per container, and then as well, you'll have the additional requirement for vitamin D in the U.S. that we decided not to go ahead with in Canada. The main reason that Health Canada gave for not going ahead with the vitamin D declaration is that a large number of, of Canadian foods or all foods that are actually healthy have 0% vitamin D naturally. And a consumer may look at a food label and say, oh, this food has 0% vitamin D, it must not be healthy not understanding that it could be like an orange, for example, or something that just doesn't contain uh, vitamin D naturally. So Health Canada actually decided to drop that vitamin D declaration. So again, when approaching the Canadian market, that's one of the changes you'll want to see in your label. I did want to briefly mention the difference in the timeline of implementation for labels. So we understand that your U.S. timeline is very similar to ours in Canada. Manufacturers uh, would making 10 million or more in annual sales requiring to change by January 1st of 2020 and those with less than 10 million in annual sales being required to change by January 1st of 2021. So again, those timelines are very similar to our Canadian timelines for modernization. Um, so we're sort of all in that same boat moving forward to a new format for NFTs. I also wanted to display the difference between the original or current ingredient declarations and the new format for ingredient declarations. So I'll just let you let, take a look at this slide for a moment. Um, you can see on the left we have several, and I, I, I'm picking on sugar today, I don't mean to, it just it is the reality of one of the ingredients that a lot of our clients want to talk to us about. So you can see in the label on the left, this product has three sources of sugar. It has fancy molasses, brown sugar, and white sugar. Under the new Canadian format, um, each type of ingredient, sugar ingredient will have to be listed individually, but combined together in order of uh, descending order as we mentioned a minute ago. So you'll now notice in the new format that because those three sources of sugar add up to sugar being the highest ingredient of the product, it now moves to being the food first ingredient on the declaration. So then we have wheat flour, vegetable shortening, liquid whole egg, et cetera, et cetera. The new format involves being placed on a white background with a border and having bullets in between the ingredients. I'm a very visual person, I don't know about yourselves, but I personally find this format much easier to look at. It's visually appealing. It's much easier to determine the ingredients. We're not looking at all caps anymore. Um, and again, they're separated by those bullets. So again, personally, I, I prefer this new format. I think it's easier for consumers to see what's in your product. But just again, keeping in mind that if you do have products, and again, we understand that a lot of prepackaged products do require sugar to you know, offset taste. Um, you know, it is a reality of what we're dealing with in fabrication. So just keeping in mind that by 2021, if your product is very high in sugar, perhaps it's time to talk to either a consultant or to your R&D team about just maybe considering alternatives if you don't want that sugar to be the first ingredient um, declared on the label. And we'll just wrap up this discussion um, by talking about the CFIA's Food Labeling Modernization Initiative. So again, keeping in mind that the CFIA is dealing with non-safety related aspects of food labeling, it's not that this uh, modernization isn't as important, it's just that the labels are not as of primary concern to food suppliers. So this modernization started, it's a three-phase modernization, it started in 2013 and carried through to 2017. With the initial forecast window of the three-year period, uh, which we're in the middle of currently, and the key changes, again, I wanted to summarize for you under CFIA's food labeling modernization. And again, these are not related to food safety, so they deal with mostly labeling declarations such as best before dates, changes to ingredient class names, percent ingredient declarations, Update to requirements for legibility, dealer name and address. So for example, in 1985, the internet wasn't a thing, websites weren't of concern. Um, we're looking at expanded country of origin requirements for imported foods, as well as updates to existing food standards to allow changes by incorporation by reference. And what the change by incorporation by reference allows is not having to go back to a full modernization process. Um, as you can see, since 1985, it's been very slow to do. 
And we'll just wrap up our discussion showing that in June of last year, um, the CFIA modernization was published in Canada Gazette 1. Again, in response to increased consumer demand for information to help support purchasing choices, a need for streamlined rules across Canada, and a need to really support innovation in the food industry and an evolution of regulatory approaches. So we often hear from clients that, you know, the Canadian food market is so stringent and it's very hard to get products into Canada. And we really want to remind companies that the Canadian framework should be considered a complementary process to approaching the market. So not to consider it so much as a barrier, um, but as that is a process to help ensure that your product really will be safe and, and, you know, um, um, uptaken by the Canadian market because it does meet certain safety standards and labeling standards. So we're halfway through our webinar time, and I thought we'd switch over now to label and health claims. So um, I've spent 20 years in this industry helping, um, consume, uh, helping companies communicate the health benefits or nutritional benefits of their consumers um, through labeling. And we really consider that label to be the interface between a company and the consumer. It's that point of sale decision making supporter that helps the consumer choose. And I love this cartoon. I've been using it in presentations for many years, and it really talks about the difference in how we approach food products today in 2020 compared to how we did 20 years ago, for example. So you might go to, you know, a food market, which now could be an alternate pharmacy. You know, we won't certainly see apples on health claims on apples per se, but there's that concept of prevention and remedy and cure um, looking at food products, which we didn't necessarily see 20 years ago. And the way to approach food label claims in Canada, there's, separate, there's several different pathways, and I've outlined that for you today in the summary chart. So you'll see a lot of the same claims that we have in the U.S. framework. So we have a framework for nutrient content claims under Section B01500 of the FDR. We have a section for health claims under Section B1600 of the FDR. And that can be broken into several subcategories, including general claims, function claims, and disease risk reduction claims. We'll talk a little bit about each of those claim categories now. But we also have this offshoot of disease risk reduction claims that are called therapeutic claims. And that's a different claim category in Canada. It requires a different burden of evidence, but it is a different, definitely a possibility for certain types of food. So when we consider nutrient content claims, again, we're in the same thread of thinking of ingredients of health benefit and ingredients of health concern. It's a balancing act. So considering ingredients of health benefit and health risk, health benefit, we have energy, we have carbohydrates, protein, and fiber. When we consider health risk on the other side of the scale, we have our cholesterol, our sugar, our fat, and our sodium. Understanding that not all fat is bad, but just certain saturated fats or trans fat would be of health risk. So we do have at London Canada specific requirements for many nutrients, as well as for vitamins and minerals. And that's, again, declared through your nutrition facts tables, which identifies certain ingredients of health benefit and health risk, as we just mentioned a moment ago. There are definitely numerous nutrient content claims available for ingredients of both health benefit and health risk. But obviously, when we consider the consumer messaging, the message differs. So on the health benefit side, we'd be looking for claims of a nutrient content nature, such as high in, lean, an excellent source of, or light, so, for example, an excellent source of vitamin C, high in protein, light or lean. On the health risk side, common claim language for nutrient content claims includes free from, low in, reduced, or no added. So, low in sugar, um, no added sugar, reduced calories, or free from fat as examples of currently approved nutrient content claims. I did want to mention, and we will show a case study in a few moments, that there are differences in the, cal the calculation or criteria for making nutrient content claims between the Canadian and U.S. systems. And it's actually interesting that it's a benefit to some companies when they come to the Canadian market. They're actually able to move to a higher nutrient content claim than they had in the U.S. market. So we've done some claim reviews and nutritional analysis for clients, and for example, they would have a good source of claim in the U.S. When they come to Canada, they're going to have an excellent source of. So it's interesting to see that there are those subtle variations when considering claim criteria for nutrient content claims in the Canadian market. Talking about food health claims now, this is the reason that I come to work every day, to get excited about general claims. So when we consider general claims, they don't refer to specific uh, health effects, diseases, or health conditions, but they're considered to be broad claims that promote health through healthy eating or provide dietary guidance claims such as healthy for you or healthy choice. 
There are no specific regulations governing their use and no standard nutritional criteria required for their use. General claims can also be present as symbols on food labels or advertisements. They can appear in the logo or the name of a health organization, and they may be used in conjunction with that organization's health information program. And a good example of that is the health check symbol. You may be familiar, it's that green check mark. So that's an affiliation um, with, uh, I think it's Canadian uh, Heart and Stroke. So you may see that on a label. Seeing that automatically your mind goes to the fact that, oh, this food contains ingredients that are healthy for me. The next category of food health claims for Canada is function claims, and they refer to the maintenance or support of bodily functions associated with good health or performance. So that can relating to nutrients of a food or other components of a food on normal function or biological activities of the body. These claims obviously would relate to a positive contribution to health and to the maintenance of physiological functions, physical or mental performance. So I've given an example here of an approved function claim for Canada and that's that consumption of green tea helps to protect blood lipids from oxidation. So that's a pretty decent claim to appear on a food product, um, and it really communicates the health benefit of green tea um, on blood lipids. The next category we'll talk about briefly is disease risk reduction claims, and they link the consumption of a food or a food constituent to a reduced risk of developing a diet-related disease or condition within the context of the total diet. There are two types of disease risk reduction claims in Canada. General, which refer to a group of foods or nutrients rather than to specific foods, or product-specific disease risk reduction claims, which refer to specific types of food. And I wanted to give some examples of approved disease risk reduction claims in Canada. These claims were all approved several years ago, so in the 1990s and in the 2000s. So examples are sodium, potassium, and the risk of hypertension calcium, vitamin D, and the risk of osteoporosis, saturated and trans fats, and the risk of heart disease, vegetables, fruits, and the risk of certain cancers, and non-fermentable carbohydrates, and the risk of dental caries. Later legislation has further improved the ability to make health claims on foods, and that falls under the category of therapeutic claims, and we'll talk about that claim category next. So therapeutic claims were established about 10 years ago, and they really enable consumers to easily recognize the health benefits of foods. They're a subset of disease risk reduction claims. You'll remember in the chart that we had a few slides ago, it's an offshoot of that disease risk reduction category. But they identify specified claim language relating to the dosage of food consumed and the associated health benefit by consuming that food. So therapeutic claims enables consumers to easily recognize the health benefit of the food, they can relate to the treatment, mitigation of a health-related disease or condition, or about the restoration, correction, or modification of bodily functions. They also include a dose per serving of the food and a total daily dose of food. And that's the key difference between therapeutic claims and disease risk reduction claims, their parent category. So I wanted to provide an example of an approved therapeutic claim for you today, and this one has to do with omega-3 fatty acids. This is one of the more recent claim approvals. So this is an example of claim language that could appear on your food label. So in brackets, serving size from the NFT of brand name of the name of the food provides X percent of the daily amount of long chain omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, which has been shown to help lower triglycerides. So for example, 100 grams of Christus fabulous fish sticks provide 15% of the daily amount of long chain omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA and then that consumption has been shown to help lower triglycerides. So it's really interesting that that type of claim is really moving more towards a therapeutic claim, which is why it's called that. Um, you can't just put that claim on a food label. There are stipulations. I've given some examples of approved therapeutic claims on this slide, and you'll notice that many of these claims are related to cholesterol. So we have psyllium fiber and blood cholesterol lowering, plant sterols, oat fiber, unsaturated fats, and barley products and cholesterol lowering as well as I mentioned a minute ago, EPA, DHA, omega-3 fatty acids, and triglyceride lowering. So you're probably thinking, well, Krista, that's really boring. Why do all these claims have to do with blood cholesterol lowering? And the reason for that is when we consider standards of evidence um, required to substantiate these therapeutic claims for foods, cholesterol really is a validated endpoint for cardiovascular disease. So there are other endpoints, such as blood pressure, which really everybody knows are factors in, in uh, cardiovascular disease. But from a regulatory perspective, they're not considered as validated as something like cholesterol, which is a tried and true biomarker for cardiovascular disease. 
So Health Canada, in reviewing claim applications for therapeutic claims, has stuck to biomarkers that they know are really tangible and that they know have clinical research in support of their um, application. So I wanted to provide um, an example of a high-level summary evidence portfolio that Health Canada has published. And it's really important to notice that, or to note, that Health Canada has made efforts in recent years to improve its transparency in communicating regulatory decisions to industry. So we used to joke 10 years ago when I was involved in a big health claim submission for soy, um, you know, that you know, we had an industry sponsor that spent a number of years and a large amount of money investing in this health claim portfolio, submitted it to the government, and it was kind of like throwing a stone into a black hole. So nobody really knew what happened, what the outcome of that health, health Canada decision was. And so you'll see this published in May 2016. Health Canada now provides these high-level summary of the evidences, and they actually publish the result of their decision of a therapeutic review, whether that's favorable or unfavorable. The summaries include the acceptable health claim wording, as well as conditions for carrying the health claim on that food product. So you'll recall on the last slide, we had that bulb, that bubble that showed what the, the condition was and how that claim wording should be presented. And that really helps companies who may have similar food products to not reinvent the wheel if they were considering therapeutic claims for Canada. So I did just want to mention before we move on that, you know, we talked about those types of foods that require pre-market review. You would have to undergo a pre-market review and um, submit a fairly extensive evidence portfolio to be able to make aggressive claims of these nature, like therapeutic claims, but there is a, a really transparent process by which to do that, and we do have um, companies such as ourselves that are established in helping obtain those favorable Health Canada decisions for foods. So quickly, we'll just talk a bit about label claims. So moving away from health claims, I've given some examples of really common label claims. So natural, not one that we recommend a lot of the time because it does lead to compliance issues in some instances, organic, gluten-free, kosher, and halal. So I'll talk to you for a few minutes about organic claims. I wanted to mention that organic labeling is definitely a voluntary claim in Canada. It's not mandatory. I have the use here of the Canadian Organic or Biologic Canada logo. And that can be used on single ingredient organic products as well as multi-ingredient products that contain a minimum of 95% organic content. Imported products also qualify to use this logo as long as there's an added statement for imported foods in pro close proximity to logo, so either product of USA, for example, or imported. And we've talked a lot today about regulatory modernization and ASCOA, uh, there will be a test later on all my acronyms, ASCOA is the U.S.-Canadian Organic Equivalence Agreement, and it really has helped to facilitate uh, trade. So in 2019, um, ASCOA actually streamlined the regulatory burden of companies wanting to export organic foods to Canada. So this equivalence agreement acknowledges that there are similarities between the USDA National Organic Program and the Canadian Organic Product Regulations. And it's really streamlined the certification process, eliminating need for separate certifications, and allows food products that are being exported to Canada to allow one or both of these organic loadouts permitted, provided that keeping in mind that that organic product of the food has to be 95% or more. So you may see on some foods use of the Canadian organic logo, the USDA organic logo, or some foods may contain both logos. I wanted to briefly touch on GMO labeling. Again, GMO labeling, despite much political movement, still remains a voluntary claim in Canada. Suppliers can demonstrate participation in the non-GMO project verification program uh, by displaying uh, the non-GMO project verified seal on their products, but I did want to highlight that there is a bilingual version required for Canada. Um, so you can see that Project Sans OGM Verifié um, listed on the Canadian logo, and I wanted to highlight that this is not a GMO-free claim. There is a subtle difference. So for fun, and just to give you guys a break, I thought it'd be fun to test our nutrition labeling knowledge. So I put together a little bit of a short case study on the differences in packaging compliance between Canada and the U.S. So let's see if now that we've gone through the labeling requirements, you can see some of the main differences in the presented U.S. and Canadian food labeling for the sample product. So this is Benito's white bean chips, and we'll use this as a visual representation for the difference in a product as we help it move through U.S. compliance through Canadian compliance. So on the left, we have the, cur the, the current U.S. version of the Benitos, and on the right, we have moved to a Canadian-compliant version of Benitos. So I'll just let you study that for a moment, and then in a moment, we'll highlight a few of the changes. So 
Okay, because you guys are on mute, I know you can't jump in and identify that, but we'll go through it quickly. So first and foremost, we see our bilingual um, white bean chips has been changed to Crusty d'Arco Blanc. Um, we have our grams of protein claim, our high fiber claim, and our change from metric, uh, imperial to metric, I'm sorry. Now, I mentioned before the difference in nutrient content claims, and you can actually see on the right that we've gone from a calculation of 5 grams protein in the U.S. to a calculation of 10 grams protein per serving in Canada. So that's actually a benefit in translating that nutritional information over to the Canadian system. Again, on the left, and I apologize, the font is small, but you can see on the left it's a high fiber product. When we move to the Canadian system, it's a very high fiber product. So again, another benefit of moving over to the Canadian labeling system. You'll see that the net weight moved from ounces over to grams as well. Now I do apologize, oh, sorry, and one more thing, beans are better. So that's obviously a, a wonderful marketing claim and it's very catchy, um, but when we conducted the regulatory review of this SKU, we decided that that was a, a, a risk in making that claim, that it could be considered an implied health claim. What does better mean? Would they need scientific evidence to make that claim? So we recommended that that claim be removed for the, for the Canadian product. Uh, looking at the back of pack, again, I apologize, this is very small, but it's the best I can do, but you can kind of get the gist of it. So you'll see, and one consideration is that that bilingual copy does take up a fair amount of real estate on the package. So when we consider the romance copy, which is what we call, you know, that, that discussion or marketing statements, one of the reasons why it helps to work with um, a consultant or, again, your in-house graphics um, to, is to work with graphic designers who are really experienced in knowing how to position this extra requirement of content that needs to go on the label in a way where you can still communicate the key messaging. And I think we've done a good job of that here. So again, on quick glance, just looking at the difference, your U.S. Nutrition Facts Table uh, panel, I'm sorry, we've switched over to a Canadian Nutrition Facts Table. On the left, your ingredient listing has now been translated into both official languages, and you can see that takes up a fair difference in the amount of label space. We have our content claims again, so we've gone from 5 grams of protein to 10. We've gone from high fiber to very high fiber. We've kept that zero grand trans, um, and we've highlighted that in a bigger font so the consumer can re uh, easily again identify that. We still have the Viva the Bean because we didn't feel that was an ingredient or a claim of risk, I'm sorry. But then again, looking at that romance copy, it really moves over to a bigger portion of the real estate on the back of pack. So again, lots of similarities, but lots of differences as well. Um, and again, um, just keeping in mind the strategy behind wanting to make sure that your key label components are easily identified in both languages. So we'll take a pause now. I think we're doing okay for time. We've got about 10 minutes to go, and I really wanted to provide an overview of the Canadian food safety regulations. So we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that the Safe Food for Canadian regulations were brought into effect in 2000, were brought, the Act was passed in 2012, but the regulations bringing the Act into um, reality were just published in January of 2019. So we're a year in now. It's interesting to note that this month, well, I guess last month now, since we're February, additional requirements for fruit, fresh fruit and vegetables uh, came in under the SFCR as well. But we'll briefly consider the five W's of the Safe Food for Canadian Regulations, the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why. So when we talk about the SFCR, who are we dealing with? We have Canada's Governor General in council with recommendations from various ministers, including our Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food, Minister of Health, Minister of Justice, and Minister of Finance. And that makes sense because we're bringing in aspects of trade, health, and potentially law if we're looking at compliance. When we consider who regulates the Safe Food for Canadian uh, Regulations, or the SFCR, I'll call them for the rest of the talk, we're really focused on CFIA, or the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So we recall from the beginning of our presentation that the CFIA enforces policies and regulation relating to the importation of foods, beverages, and agricultural products into Canada. CFIA has the authority to refuse the entry of import shipments to Canada that are not compliant with Canadian requirements. This refusal can be prior to or at arrival, upon arrival at the Canadian border. And that's important to note. We've had a lot of talk with clients, you know, about do I really have to change my packaging? Can I not just start with small shipments and try to get them through borders if I'm not looking at major ports? The answer is yes, you probably could, but would you want to take that risk? Um, more and more the border, and that's the next player we have here is the CBSA, the Border Patrol is becoming much more um, involved and aware of the regulations with the passing of the Safe Food for Canadian regulations. So it is becoming more difficult, uh, we've heard from distributors, brokers, and from our clients, um, to get non-compliant Canadian products through the border. 
The CBSA also plays a key role in supporting the SFCR. They assist with the governments of imported foods and they ensure compliance at the border. It's the CBSA that's conducting the initial inspections of imported foods and agricultural products at all Canadian entry points and verifying the compliance of those foods with departments and agencies of the Government of Canada requirements. I wanted to note that the CFIA also has a border lookout process which provides the CBSA commodity information for goods identified as having an increased risk. And the CBSA uses that information to manage imports that may throw as a threat to Canadian consumers. Who is impacted by the SFCR at the border? Well, obviously companies such as yourselves that are foreign suppliers who want to export your food products to Canada. It also impacts Canadian food businesses who may import your food that manufacture, process, treat, preserve, grade, package, or label food for export. We won't focus on that today because that's food going in the other direction. Um, but also uh, Canadian food businesses that store or, store or handle meat products in imported condition from companies um, such as yourselves for inspection by the CFIA. Next we'll talk about what. What is the SFCR? SFCR is a modern regulatory legislative framework intended to govern the safe food commodities imported to, exported from, and interprovincially traded within the uh, country of Canada. The SFCR is a single set of regulations consolidated from 14 previous existing Canadian regulations which have since been repealed. And that's really important to understand. So food companies used to have to, have to consider 14 separate sets of regulation. Now they just have to deal with this one overarching umbrella, the Safe Food for Canadian Regulations. This has helped to improve consistency of rules across all types of food and between food businesses. It's helped to reduce the administrative burden for companies looking to export foods to Canada. And it also helps to enable food businesses to become innovative through outcome-based provisions in the SFCR. I wanted to note that the SFCR applies only to food for human consumption and the requirements are dependent on business activity and food commodity. So I won't read this list to you, but I just wanted you to have it for reference. This is a list of the 14 sets of regulations that were repealed under the SFCR. And you'll note that one of those sets of regulations was the organic product regulations. So I have clients that often say to me, well, Krista, we're talking about organic claims, what do we do now? So the organic product regulations still exist, they've just been encompassed under the Safe Food for Canadian regulations. And we talked about the specifics of that a while ago. There are also 16 parts to the SFCR. Again, I'm not going to read this to you. We will focus on three specific parts that are really key information, I feel, points for you to have today. And those three parts have to do with import licensing, preventive control plans, and traceability. So we'll just take a few minutes to talk about each of those three key aspects of the SFCR. The first being import licensing. So import licenses are required for any food which crosses a federal or provincial border in Canada. Canadian importers need a license to import foods. Foreign suppliers exporting to Canada do not need a license. So that's one of the key points I'd like you to take away from today. There's a licensing fee payable to the Government of Canada of $250 Canadian and an import license under the SSVR is valid for a two-year period. I'm going to list the activities that prompt the need for a license under the SFCR. So importing food, as we mentioned a minute ago, manufacturing, processing, treating, preserving, grading, packaging, or labeling food to cross a provincial or territorial border, as we mentioned a minute ago, as well as storing or handling meat products in their imported condition. It's important to work with an SFCR licensed importer to ensure that your food products meet all applicable import requirements of the SFCR. The next key aspect is PCPs or preventive control plans. A PCP is a written plan outlining that how you would go about ensuring that the food product you import to Canada is safe and fit for consumption, that it meets applicable regulatory requirements for safety, grading, standards, labeling, packaging, and net quantity under the SFCR, and how to demonstrate how potential hazards in the manufacturing of your food product are identified, eliminated, or controlled. PCPs are based on the seven HACCP principles, including hazard evaluations, determination of critical control points, or CCPs, the establishing and monitoring of critical limits, establishing corrective actions, verifying HACCP plans, and having accurate formal documentation on the above processes on your premises. Key features of a preventive control plan include written plans and procedures, identification and control of potential food hazards, setting critical control points, or CCPs, to minimize the risk of contamination or adulteration to your food product, as well as understanding your products, 
and the equipment and procedures used to manufacture or fabricate your product. Your PCP must also demonstrate how potential uh, food hazards are identified, eliminated, or controlled. The third key requirement under the SFCR has to do with traceability, and traceability requirements are in place for all imported foods to Canada, so all exported foods from the USA. I wanted to note that traceability requirements typically fall to Canadian retailers, that they're based on Codex Elementaris or not international principles, and that's the ability to trace each food one step forward and one step backwards. So tracing the food forward to the person to whom the food was provided and backwards to the immediate supplier of that food. Traceability records must be retained by Canadian food retailers. They can be digital or handwritten. They need to be legible and also accessible two years after the date of import and provided to CFIA upon request. The next W is where. So the safe food for Canadian regulations apply to all food commodities imported to, exported from, and interprovincially traded within Canada. Ensuring the safety of the Canadian food supply is of the utmost importance to the health and safety of the Canadian population. I love timelines, so again, I did a brief timeline on how, uh, or when, I'm sorry, the Safe Food for Canadian regulations came into place. I won't read everything to you on this slide in the interest of time, but basically, as I mentioned, in 2012, the Safe Food for Canadians Act received royal assent, bringing it into law, and then over a seven-year period between 2013 and 2018, or 19, the Canadian government and CFIA conduct various industry consultations. <laughs> that was largely to consider the impact of the Safe Food for Canadian regulations on small to medium-sized businesses. So understanding that large Canadian businesses would have larger staffing and mandates and the ability to better interact um, on, at a rapid level with the SFCR requirements for PCPs, whereas smaller medium-sized enterprises, because they had less staff or less funding, um, might not be able to adapt so quickly. So there was that timeline by which uh, the Canadian government consulted with industry. But as of January 15th of last year, the Safe Food for Canadian regulations came into force. When we consider why, why are we in this period of intense regulatory modernization? Why do Health Canada and the CFIA feel the need to update? So this, the short answer is because of this broad period of Canadian regulatory modernization, really the previous food safety legislation predated even the existence of CFIA. 1985 was a long time ago. Food technology has really evolved during that time. Our food supply chain has become much more complex. And there are increased risks to food, animal health, and plants that have changed over the course of the last 30 years. So uh, the Canadian government really felt that updating the Canadian food safety regulation will, as we mentioned before, improve not only operational efficiencies, but consistency as well as consumer confidence in knowing that they have that. You know, when people see this, the Canadian flag, that product of Canada or imported to Canada, they really recognize that as an international symbol of quality. So bringing your products to, to the Canadian market, you really have that understanding because there are certain pre-market processes that that product is of a high, um, high quality or high standard. Again, we mentioned that the SFCR wants to align with internationally record stand, recognized standards such as Codex and helps to prevent the N or number of foodborne illness outbreaks as well as helping Canadians to rapidly remove unsafe food from the supply chain. So as a foreign supplier, I just wanted to make a couple of notes for delegates today. You should know the Canadian import requirements. So that's the safe food for Canadian regulations, the food and drug regulations like we talked about earlier. You may need to know the health of animal regulations if you're importing, um, if you're exporting, I'm sorry, meat and poultry products, as well as the plant protection regulations specifically the level of herbicides in your food if you're going to be exporting uh, botanical products. As well, there are CFIA requirements and CBSA requirements. But overall, we say, at a basic principle, know your food. So is your food inherently safe? Does it meet all Canadian regulatory requirements? Is it of a nature, substance, and quality that combines with both compositional and grade requirements? And is it labeled, advertised, and presented or packaged in a way that is not false and not misleading. Finally, know your supply chain. Where was your food fabricated and track it through its life span, so from cradle to grave or farm to fork? Where does the product go once it leaves your warehouse? Does it go to another U.S. warehouse before it's shipped across the border or does it go directly to Canada? Where does it land in Canada? In a distribution center or directly to retail? Those are all key questions to consider when mapping out your responsibilities under the SSCR as a foreign supplier. 
At source, we always recommend that you work with a Canadian licensed importer, so somebody that has an SFCR Canada import license. Um, firms such as ourselves and or your um, importer can help you to create and implement a PCP or a preventive control plan in conjunction with your distribution model. That PCP will help to demonstrate that your food product is manufactured, prepared, stored, packaged, and labeled in standards comparable to the SFCR. We ensure that you have processes for hazard assessment in the event of recall and that you have that recall and complaints procedure in place in the event of a recall. I wanted to briefly mention we had a client uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago now actually, um, that had an immediate need for a food recall procedure under the SFCR. And what happened was they had an ingredient, um, monk fruit, um, that is an approved sweetener in Canada at a certain limit, but isn't an actually approved food ingredient yet. There's a process in place for that, but not uh, currently today. And what happened was uh, the client actually forgot to send us, uh, it was a new staff member, and they forgot to send us a whole set of labels for a product, um, and so it went to market without source reviewing it. And unfortunately, um, there was a trade complaint because monk fruit's a well-known ingredient, and so CFIA called our, our client and said, you know, you have this um, ingredient um, that's deemed to be not safe under the SFCR, uh, you're going to have to recall that product. And what started as a small recall from one distributor ended up being a national recall from 10 distributors. And this was all just because of the presence of an undeclared ingredient in a food product and ended up being um, a very unfortunate incident for our client um, and obviously an unfortunate inc incident and a costly incident having to re recall all of that product. So again, we just always encourage companies when you're considering the market, don't see, don't see it as a burden, but just do your homework. So again, work with your internal regulatory team or work with a consultant um, to help you ensure um, that your product will meet the requirements. And um, as Susta said at the beginning of the talk, those activities are eligible for funding under the 50% discount under the program, which really is a wonderful resource uh, for companies such as yourselves. And I just wanted to finish with a slide on non-resident importers, or NRIs. So I mentioned before that U.S. companies are not required to have an export license, but you are able to eligible to apply for a license as a non-resident importer, and that's under the FSSR agreement. So if you were to apply for a, an import license as a non-resident importer, all import requirements under the SFCR, so that's import licensing, PCPs, and traceability would require, would it apply? Um, you would be able to import international foods and export them to Canada, but you wouldn't be able to directly ship them to Canada. They must enter the U.S. first. So, for example, a U.S. non-resident importer would not be able to import cheese from France directly to Canada. The cheese would be subject to U.S. governmental food oversight, such as FSMA, before it could be exported to Canada. So it would land in the U.S., be subject to FSMA, but then be shipped to Canada or exported to Canada and also subject to the SFCR. So it's a bit of a complicated situation. Not all U.S. companies um, desire that, but in some instances it's necessary for large food companies that have multi, uh, multiple countries in which they fabricate the product. So we made it, we're in the home stretch. I just wanted to provide a summary slide for you. I realize we've given a lot of information today, but I hope that it's been helpful. So just if we really consider all the considerations that companies such as yourself would want to undertake when considering the Canadian market for export, we really want you to think about packaging compliance, your ingredients and your label claims. So are your ingredients and your label claims going to be compliant once they enter the Canadian market? We do have that bilingual labeling component. We don't want to see um, you folks exporting your products just in English. You will have products at the border. There are import requirements specifically um, for exported foods. There are food safety uh, support and as well as considering requirements for distribution. So that was your preventative control plans as well as traceability requirements. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, we provided both my contact information and email there, as well as Heidi's information um, with Argyle, as well as phone and email. If there are any follow-up questions after the fact, um, either of us can be reached at that time. So thank you so much for your attention. Wow, Krista, thank you so much. That was um, so much great information. I know um, we frequently get questions um, about all of these things that you just spoke about. Um, and in particular, um, when companies are getting into compliance for Canada. So um, I think this webinar will be a great resource for everybody who is on the webinar. And um, we're also going to link the recording of the webinar as well as a PDF of your presentation um, to our website. So if you want to rewatch this, you can always log into your MySusta account and go to webinars, and it will be there. 
we will also send an email later today with the link and the PDF as well. Hmm. Um, I am going to read out some questions that have been coming in through the chat. So if anybody does have questions, uh, feel free to type it in there. Um, first up, is there somewhere we can get a list of licensed importers? Um, not a license. Uh, we'll have to look at uh, whether or not they're licensed, but if you do, there is a debt database that we go through to find um, importers of certain products. So there is a list, um, but uh, whether, and that would only just give you the, the, um, the names of the companies that uh, import certain products, but whether or not they're licensed, um, since this is a new uh, regulation, will have to be de like, uh, determined with that, that sure. importer. Yep, and yeah. uh, what we always tell companies too is you know, the events that we put on, um, if it's a trade mission, we work with Heidi and her team at Argyle um, to bring in you know, buyers that are vetted to those trade missions. And um, you know, a great way to meet those kinds of contacts as well is participating in trade shows. Um, all right, next question. Do alcohol exports require a PCP? Oh. Um, I'm oh, sorry, that, that one's for me. I, I, I've been asked this question before and I should have made a note of it. Um, I will get back to the group on that. Um, that is a good question and I apologize offhand. I should have that memorized and I don't, but I'll make a note of that there and I'll circulate that through Heidi um, and through Cessna as well. Sure, great. Um, and another question on alcohol, uh, resources for alcohol exports. Can you provide links? So uh, when it comes to alcohol products, all of the provinces have uh, different boards, so and and they have their own processes. Um, uh, so it'll depend on which provinces you're you're targeting. Um, uh, for the the Ontario market, um, it would be the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, and there is a site called um, Doing Business with LCBO that has a lot of great resources. Um, for um, Quebec, it would be SAQ, um, where you can uh, find some information there on their site. Uh, and for BC, it'll be the BC uh, Liquor Board that, that would have some information as well. So um, alcohol is provincially regulated, uh, um, so there's different sets of regulations per province. Got it. So it's kind of like how in the states alcohol is regulated per state and you have to get a distribution license or whatever it is um, in a state before you can sell there. Um, Canada works similarly with their different provinces. So it will depend on what province you plan on moving into. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Okay. I mean, the, the labeling requirements will be the same in all of the provinces, um, but when it okay. comes to the technicalities of, um, uh, of actually uh, bringing in the products, that will depend on the individual provinces. Okay. Um, all right. Well, the last question also about alcohol. Is there going to be a separate <laughs> webinar or document for alcohol labeling for Canada export? So um, maybe what we'll do is put together um, a document that has a bunch of the different links and information as it pertains to alcohol specifically and send that out. Um, yeah, and we did do um, a webinar on alcohol specifically, I recall, two years ago. Uh, Did we? Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. So yes. uh, this is yeah. ringing a bell. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so uh, and that was, um, I mean, not too dated. Um, we spoke specifically about the Ontario market. So mm -hmm. um, if we can find the link, I think that would be really helpful for the alcohol companies. Um, and again, like um, my contact information is listed here. If you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out to. Uh, me uh, anytime and um, uh, happy to answer questions. Great. And that webinar should be in the list of webinars that you can access through your MySusta account when you click on webinars 
and it's the most recent webinars are at the top. So you'll see as soon as we get the recording of this webinar, I'll go ahead and post that. Um, but then you'll see all the past webinars um, beneath that. So I think if you keep scrolling, you'll probably find that webinar. Thanks for reminding me of that, Heidi, that we, we did do something on alcohol. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I don't remember if we did specifically, I think very briefly, we looked at labeling in that uh, webinar. But um, okay. again, uh, I can, uh, if, the, if the companies want to reach out to me directly, I can uh, point them in the right direction. Okay. Great. Um, well, thank you both so much. Again, that was just jam-packed with great content and information. Um, and be looking out for an email from me later today with the presentation and a link to the recording. Um, so thank you, everybody. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks, Krista. Thank, thank you. you. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>